Hi everybody, uh, this is Gabriela from Scope Europe and uh, we have reached our final workshop of the day, uh, which as a matter of fact has been highly expected. So first of all, I would like to thank all the speakers and introduce them. Uh, we are very happy to welcome uh, Paul Breitbart, uh, Director uh, EU Operations and Strategy at TrustArc, Mark Crandall, Global Head of Privacy at Google Cloud, Cornelia Kutterer, uh, Senior Director, Rule of Law and Responsible Tech, European Government Affairs at Microsoft, and Lorena Marciano, uh, Director, Global Privacy and Data Strategy at Cisco. So we will be discussing uh, international data transfers and our speakers will be giving an overview of the legal challenges imposed uh, by SHRIMS2, talk about the existing instruments to address the issue, how the SHRIMS2 has impacted uh, cl the cloud industry, their day-to-day -day compliance exercises and so forth, and how codes of conduct and more specifically the UCloud CUC and its third country module have this potential to guarantee the enforcement of European standards while creating an appropriate environment for businesses to thrive. Uh, so with that in mind, let's get started. I would like to invite Cornelia to, to kick off the discussion. So Cornelia, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Gabriela. And um, first of all, thank you very much for having me here. And also, uh, I want to use the opportunity very quickly to thank uh, the Scope Europe, uh, Frank, Jorn, and the whole team, as well as uh, the Belgium uh, Data Protection Authority, in particular David Stephen and our fund, uh, for their leadership uh, in in really reaching this this uh, milestone today. Uh, it's really an achievement. And uh, I was really inspired in listening in all the other sessions, and uh, in particular, my female colleagues, uh, Corinna from SAP, uh, Charlotte from Oracle, and Aliki from Salesforce, um, in how motivating uh, that exercise is also. And um, this was all done, and now we have sort of this uh, additional workload uh, in front of us, um, and hopefully we will also at one point get to another milestone with another celebration on this data transfer module. Now, with this said, I just want to go back a little bit and, and uh, what I was asked to talk about the, the um, follow-up uh, on the Schrems 2 decision uh, last year in July and the uncertainty that uh, the decision left um, and how urgently it is required that the EU and the US um, find solutions for permanent space for transatlantic free flow of data. And of course, as you all know, Trump's two decision is not only a transatlantic data flow, but a global data flow question. And uh, in this context, I just want to highlight the impact such disruptions have on uh, both economic uh, impact, um, the disruption to cross-border data flow is adversely affecting businesses of all sizes, across all sectors, uh, with lower productivity and resiliency and reduced market reach. Um, so. Um, this could have a uh, tremendous uh, impact, in particular also where governments are looking for robust economic recovery. There's also societal impacts um, of disruption to cross-border flow. Just think about, especially in, in the times of today, in uh, global healthcare research. So um, we, we believe this is also nece necessary to address and last the functional impact uh, this has on organizations of all sizes across all sectors um, that rely on cross-border data flows for their operations, products, and services. Um, and this really includes as issues as digital security, global innovation value chain, and workforce development. So with this broader context, um, we really do hope that, uh, in particular, um, the gap between the United States and the EU over new privacy shield framework will be soon bridged. Um, and um, Microsoft and other companies here represented um, will do everything we can to encourage government leaders on both sides of the Atlantic and beyond to address local access issues very quickly. Um, this said, um, just a couple of words on how, how we have perceived um, 
the Shams two decision and how we reacted in 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 the context of it, and it has been really a journey. The first thing is on on the day uh, we we have been prepared to to address the judgment and have very quickly um, addressed it by first of all to ensure that. Um, the standard contractual clause is covering all customer data and personal data in our online services and professional services. And we began very quickly to evaluate then supplementary measures um, to, to be put in place to address um, the Schrems to judgment. In, in this context, we have uh, immediately committed to, to challenge government requests for access to customer data uh, when we have a lawful basis to do so and um, to provide a redress to individuals if we improperly disclose their personal data to government. So these were our first and immediate reactions. We have then also looked uh, at our four fundamentals that underline Microsoft's privacy commitments to customers, how they control the data, uh, they can choose where the data is located, that we secure our data in trust and in transit, and that we defend um, the data of our customers. Um, in, in November, the European Data Protection uh, Board came uh, forward with a draft um, recommendation. And of course, uh, as everybody else, we are currently looking and hoping uh, that the recommendations will allow to address um, address the safeguards that, that will be required and necessary in, in the organizational technical um, uh, way. And um, so, so this is, this is uh, where we are currently. Um, we believe that um, we're, we're generally very optimistic that we will find solutions in the near future. Um, Europe and the US have been cooperating in this area for a long time, and as many here uh, on the panel, uh, we have we have already experienced the negotiations uh, after the safe harbor decision uh, towards the privacy shield, and we're pretty optimistic that we can find solutions. On the longer time scale, we need to reach consensus on appropriate safeguards regarding national surveillance and legal intelligence corporations, and we're looking uh, at the relationship between national security and international civil rights. Uh, last, um, we have earlier this month announced a new pledge for the EU, um, which a plan we are calling the EU Data Boundary, which uh, for Microsoft Cloud. Again, it is um, an, 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 a commitment towards the requirements of our customers. Um, uh, responding to the customers that want to have greater data residency commitments. Um, and uh, in that space, of course, we want to bolster our ability uh, also to make legal challenges to some non-EU governmental demands for access to data. At the same time, it's important to note that any technology provider with sufficient presence in the US, even if it's based in Europe, is subject to legal processes. So what we also need is in this space uh, political solutions. I'm inspired and hope that with the third trialogue on the e-evidence uh, proposal that is taking place today as well, that we are coming very quickly to uh, finalization of this a legislative process, which will, I hope, uh, open the um, negotiations for the EU-US law enforcement agreement, and 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 that can can certainly help in in addressing this particular issue that has already been mentioned in the previous panel as well. Um, so, with all of that said, I think we have a couple of things that we can discuss in more detail. The uh, module now has been uh, one of the important reasons for us also to joining uh, the code of conduct. We believe that this can really help. Um, in particular, it will help companies um, to scale the assessments that they are currently required to do, uh, which, which previously has been done through adequacy decisions. In the long term, of course, we do hope that more adequacy decisions will be adopted by the European Commission in order to 
have sustainable uh, results. And with this, I hand over to my next panelist. Okay. So, uh, ah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Uh, no, I would like to quickly remind uh, the audience that the uh, Q&A session, I mean, you can send your questions throughout uh, the session. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, uh, Mark, you ready? Yeah, <laughs> All right. absolutely. absolutely. You are, for sure. All right. Uh, so, floor is yours. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> So I think as we all know, since we're on the call, today is really an historic moment for the cloud industry and European privacy. It's such a privilege to be on this virtual stage with many of the driving forces behind the success of the code. Um, I personally am honored to represent Google Cloud as one of the first cloud providers to support the initiative so many years ago and to comply with the code. And I'd like to extend congratulations to Scope Europe and uh, also to the Belgian Data Protection Authority for their leadership on this very, very important initiative. Now, from retailers to manufacturers, financial service providers, organizations across Europe rely on cloud services and Google Cloud services to run their businesses. Um, I can speak for Google Cloud, and we are committed to helping companies meet stringent data protection requirements by offering industry-leading controls, contractual commitments, and accountability tools to support their compliance needs. Now, when you think way back, um, very early in the process when the EU Commission started this initiative, which I think was more than seven years ago, we saw the benefits of the codes of conduct as tools to promote transparency and accountability in cloud services. Google Cloud was, uh, I think, one of the very first providers to support this code. And it is a product of years of meaningful collaboration between the cloud computing community, the European Commission, and data protection authorities. And this type of engagement is super important. Um, we're proud that uh, more than 100 Google Cloud Platform and Google Workspace services are already in adherence to these provisions. And this is the first ever approved pan-European code of conduct under GDPR. We believe that having a new transparency and accountability tool that helps promote trust in the cloud is great news for the industry. Now, Google Cloud will continue, of course, to follow and be certified against internationally recognized privacy and security standards like ISO 27001 and 27017 for cloud security, 27018 for cloud privacy, and the new 27701. These certifications provide independent validation of our ongoing dedication to world-class security and privacy. Also, as a day one member of the new Gaia X organization, which I think now counts for more than 200 organizations as members, we're also contributing to the work on policy rules for Gaia X, which is aimed at developing new kinds of cross company sector specific data spaces that will run on trustworthy cloud infrastructures. This initiative reaffirms Google Cloud's commitment to helping our customers navigate their compliance journey when using our services. But you know, as we just as we as 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 my colleague from Microsoft just noted, <clears throat> there's a lot of attention on international data transfers, particularly in light of the EDPB recommendations. Um, now we have an opportunity to leverage the advantages of the code for international data transfers by developing a specific module that addresses just that. The objective is to build a module that will be able to address technical contractual and organizational measures necessary for third country transfers in alignment with those recommendations by the EDPB and tailored specifically to the context of the cloud industry. This would be tremendously helpful for the cloud community in terms of legal certainty, transparency, accountability, and in particular trust. And this will also greatly benefit small medium businesses that don't necessarily have unlimited legal 
and compliance teams or resources, especially in uncertain legal times. We live at a time where compliance mechanisms for robust and durable data flows are not only important, but urgent. So I can only encourage the cloud community to join and support this initiative with their expertise so we work together as an industry and come up with solutions. Now, in terms of the codes of conduct versus existing data transfer mechanisms like standard contractual clauses or, or the previous privacy shield, um, GDR provisions are not necessarily tailored to a particular industry. More targeted discussions, collaboration, and solution finding between industry actors and data protection authorities is required so that specific guidelines can be designed when it comes to legal, technical, and organizational measures that can be implemented within a sector. A great advantage of the codes of conduct compared to, for example, standard contractual clauses is a control catalog. You have a mapping of detailed controls to help you in achieving compliance. The monitoring body is also an important element. You have an independent, third party verifying the assertions of the cloud provider. Um, so look, and we all understand the underlying concerns on SREMS 2 uh, with relation to law enforcement access. Uh, we will continue to advocate strongly for the principles we believe should guide government access to enterprise data worldwide, such as approaching enterprises directly in the course of a legitimate legal investigation if stored content or communications are sought, governments should request the data directly from the customer of the cloud providers. This approach is generally in alignment with European policy proposals and US government policy. And we're also a big supporter of transparency along with our industry peers. Customers should have the right to know when governments seek disclosure of their information and the public should understand how governments are making these requests. Governments must support transparency efforts by providers and put forward their own transparency initiatives to ensure that administrative powers are being used responsibly. And it's important to protect customer rights. Governments should follow a legal process and provide clear paths for enterprises or providers to challenge a request for data. At a minimum, governments should provide direct notification to customers when they seek to compel service providers to disclose data. Google has opposed indefinite non-disclosure orders and has fought for the right to notify customers of government requests for data. <clears throat> and of course, along with this, we'll continue to innovate to provide customers with the best technology to protect the security and privacy of their information and to including technical solutions that give customers greater control of their data and to support legal reform that promote rather than undermine such innovation. Um, and finally, last but not least, it's important to streamline government rules. Government engagement on a bilateral and multilateral level is critical for modernizing laws and establishing rules on the production of electronic evidence across borders in a manner that respects international norms and sovereignty and that resolves any potential conflicts of law. Google has supported these efforts and will continue to do so while protecting the privacy and security of our customers. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not sure if you heard it, but I say it again, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, well, now I'm really happy to invite uh, Paul to the stage, somebody that really has been contributing significantly to the drafting of the third country module initiative on the weekly basis exercises to, to try to come up with a, with a solution and giving Trust Arcs a remarkable ex expertise in the field. Uh, can you talk a little bit uh, about the role of management systems and how they can play a vital role to optimize uh, the design of uh, the third country module or any other initiative that is trying to to post solution to the to the post uh, shrimp 2 landscape paul 
Thank you, Gabriela. And let me also start by thanking for the invitation to be here and congratulating everybody at Scope Europe and all of us here together today in the General Assembly and in, in this in all these sessions for all the work involved in getting this code of conduct approved. Um, to get to this stage has not been easy work. Um, some said four years, some said seven years, some said even 10 years. Um, it was long work, that is for sure. Uh, and this is only the beginning. Um, the code of conduct approved today um, is clearly intended as a self-certification mechanism uh, to demonstrate GDPR compliance. Um, and this is not yet, as is also clear um, from the um, European Data Protection Board's decision, this is not yet the approval to also use the code of conduct for international data transfers under Article 46, Paragraph 2, Sub E. Yes, I'm a lawyer, so I keep quoting the law. Apologies for that. Um, but we are working on that next step, and that is this, this third country module that you've heard so many people refer to already today. And we are preparing it with weekly phone calls uh, to get it done um, to contribute to the real proper application of GDPR by cloud service providers, also when data is transferred outside of the EU or the EEA. And let's not forget, this is not just about the United States. This is intended for global data transfers, at least that is the aim. Whether we will manage, that is still to be seen. Um, we are optimistic, um, but maybe in the, at the end of the day, the conclusion should be that certain countries of destination will need to be excluded. We don't know that yet. We hope we can get it done for every single country. That is certainly, as mentioned, the aim. Um, but a lot of work still remains to be done, and it is complex because we need to take into account all those requirements uh, of the GDPR. We need to ensure that we can match Article 44 uh, in order not to undermine the level of protection offered by the GDPR when transferring personal data abroad. Um, and we need to bear in mind the Shams II decision and the follow-up guidance from the European Data Protection Board. Um, obviously, a code of conduct cannot change the legislation of a third country. We can advocate for it, uh, but the legal requirements are clear. Um, so also that is something where we will need to come up with smart solutions uh, that are workable both by corporate enterprises, but also by small and medium enterprises. Uh, because that in the end, it, those are in the end, the ones that can benefit most from codes of conduct like these. And yes, the updated standard contractual clauses that we hope to see still before the end of the month um, will be a great way to transfer international data, even after Schrems 2, but they still come with lots of administrative requirements in assessing the legislation of third countries. And we believe, I believe, that the Code of Conduct third country module can actually alleviate a lot of the work that is due to pre approved that is uh, need to be done due to pre approved and also independently monitored safeguards and compliance guarantees. Because also that third country module will require the approval of first the Belgian DPA and then of the European Data Protection Board before we can uh, we can bring it live. Um, so um, once you once we get it done and once we get the approval, you can also be certain that the safeguards that we will include in this third country module are the ones that are approved by the Data Protection Authority. And I believe that will also increase the trust in cloud service providers, not only because they put in place the safeguards, but because they are willing to submit to a public declaration of adherence to independent oversight at multiple levels by Scope Europe as our monitoring body, but also by the Data Protection Authority. And this is not something you would do just for fun. In response to today's announcements, I already saw on social media quite a few cynical remarks that this will not solve uh, the US surveillance issues or that this will not solve the international transfer issues. And to a certain extent, that is true. But I also call to everyone, please give us a chance because this is a sincere effort by a team of bright, experienced and serious people to find a real solution to the challenges that international data transfers are facing. Being cynical does not bring us any step closer to a solution, but working hard and looking at all the legal possibilities and technical possibilities might. And we also need to accept the economic reality because global data flows do exist, are needed, uh, and data localization is not the answer to every single transfer issue. Just looking at myself, I work for a US company that will need to process 
my personal data. Um, and for HR data, I cannot, for example, give consent. The contractual relation would not cover all the data that needs to be processed. So what should I do? Just find another job just because uh, the court has said that my data can no longer go to the US? That would also be strange because I also have a right to find work that I like. Um, and there are many examples like that, offering support uh, for uh, software that needs to be done on a 24-7 basis nowadays. So you will need to work uh, also uh, from other jurisdictions than just those in the European economic area. Um, so what will this third, third, what will this third country module uh, look like? Well, we don't know yet in detail. Uh, it is work in progress. Uh, as mentioned, but it will include an overview of the various risks identified from a legislative perspective on enforcement, uh, court proceedings, any risks that are inherent to the data themselves, especially if we are looking at special categories of data. Um, we need to look at common standards for those supplementary measures and safeguards, uh, technical or in nature, organizational in nature, uh, legal in nature, of course. Um, and ideally, that is at least my dream, um, it would also contain a dynamic overview of a common third country analysis. So what is the legislation in those third countries? And that may be something that we need to develop over time um, and uh, where all of us can contribute to share the, the analyses that we have done on legislation of third countries. I know at TrustArc we've started immediately last summer to look at the global surveillance laws and are putting those into our platform right now um, and creating maps and charts of all the surveillance laws that apply and in what situations and what oversight and redress exists. Um, so that is being developed and that will help also uh, the corporations, but also SMEs in making their assessments. Um, and Gabriela asked, so how would you use privacy management systems uh, to support all of these efforts? Well, the best way to explain that is to take a look at the various steps that also the European Data Protection Board prescribes when looking at a data transfer impact assessment. As the very first step, you need to understand your data flows. And that basically means in GDPR lingo that you would need your Article 30 processing activities register to be fully up to date uh, and be fully in order. Um, and most companies, whether big or small, by now have so many processing operations ongoing um, on a continuous basis that it has become almost impossible to keep all of that information up to date in a spreadsheet. You want to collaborate, you want to run analysis, you want to understand indeed your data flows and visualize them maybe. That is not something that can all be done in a spreadsheet. So also already there, um, a management system is helpful to get a better understanding of your data flows. It will also show immediately what countries would be involved um, and help you then to assess those third countries and document all of that properly. Um, and in addition, um, it will help to conduct the third country risk assessment themselves, as described by the GDPR. Identify um, the flow, where is it going? Is there any onward transfer taking place? What are those applicable laws? And document all the required technical and organizational measures. Um, and that is a lot of documentation, not just for the sake of documentation. Um, lots of those documents would be byproducts of everything you do. Um, basically, your accountability mechanisms, your policies and procedures to protect personal data, no matter where they go in the organization or to your business partners. Um, but that all needs to be done in a coherent, consistent and compliant manner. And that takes time. That takes serious effort. Uh, and the less time that you can spend on it by automating at least part of uh, all the documentation, uh, the more time you can spend in finding those actually solution and in developing the policies and procedures. So that, in my view, is the benefit of what a management system, a privacy management system uh, like the TrustArc platform could bring. Um, other ways are certainly possible, um, but it will contribute also to uh, to dealing with the, uh, the third country module. Um, the third country module, um, as I've said a few times now, is work in progress and we'd love your input. Um, if uh, you have ideas on what should be included, on why certain things uh, cannot be done, on uh, maybe creative solutions that you have uh, for technical, uh, technical safeguards or legal safeguards, we would love to hear from you. So also reach out 
um, to uh, the team at Scope Europe so we can also discuss those in the working group dealing with the, uh, the code of conduct. Back to you, Gabriela. Thank you very much, Paul, uh, for your key contribution today and again uh, in our daily work to try to to find uh, the solutions. Uh, again, as you said, it might not be perfect, but we, we are working really hard here. So thank you very much for your collaboration. And uh, you have rightfully stressed that it has been a long way. I think a lot of people already mentioned this throughout the day. We heard it uh, over and over again. And I think there's nobody better to to talk a little bit about how this long way can really produce some great outcomes is, is what everybody's seen today, but it has been a long process. And uh, we have Cisco here, we have Loretta, uh, a founding member who has contributed significantly uh, to this whole path. So Lorena, please. Thank you so much, Gabriela. And, uh... Uh, I want to thank you in the Scope Europe and the Data Protection of the Belgium Data Protection Authority, David and Antoine, really for the milestone that we achieved uh, today. As you said, indeed, this has been a very long journey. I've been uh, privileged, I would say, uh, to work alongside of uh, Arkesh from IBM, uh, uh, you know, Fabrizio from Workday and Charlotte from Oracles and the others um, on really, first of all, uh, putting the pen on paper and drafting the code, but also going through the very long negotiation. So it's been quite a journey, but certainly um, a journey that was really worth it. Uh, and the reason why I think it's particularly worth it is because if you are a practitioner like myself, and if your daily job is actually to find solution, as you said, Gabriela, that you know better than anyone that those solutions sometimes require a joint effort. And I think that's exactly what we realized um, when GDPR was, enfor was enforced and, and then we restarted working on the code is that we were receiving a lot of different headwinds, I would say, on what, for example, the Article 28, what it means in the cloud industry. And that was very much because it was there was a diversion of perception from different DPAs, but also from different customers on what exactly should be in the data processing agreements or what kind of evidence we should have shown to customer in, in order to be trusted. And so all of us, I think we all felt that we needed a solution that needed to be an industry solution, something robust that will tell our customer, here is how we show up as a cloud industry in front of you. Here is the type of trust and transparent and account accountable um, attitude that we want to bring in the market. That, and that's why I really want to um, echo what the other colleague said, that this has been from day one a very collaborative environment. I would say we nearly never disagreed with each other. Uh, we all were pushing on the same, from the same standpoint. We, as Paul said, really, we seriously, we took this very seriously uh, to make sure that we will find something that was robust. Uh, and I also see in uh, Paul a lot of uh, cynical response on uh, social media as well. Uh, and indeed, everybody can have you know their point of view, and I'm sure we're not gonna we're not here to solve all problems of the world, and particularly of the GDPR. But uh, we did this with the intention to create something that was robust, especially because we are putting our names on it, the names of our company. So we had to be to have a very serious approach to it. And in the same vein, if you like. This is a bit like what we're facing today. Now, I think we are a bit of the. Where we are today in Scrums 2 or DDBB recommendation, it is a bit also similar to the aftermath of GDPR. There is a lot of confusion, I would say, um, to what uh, is expected by the controller or customers, to what is expected from us, the processor, especially if you're a US company, in terms of demonstrating uh, what kind of supplementary measure you can provide uh, in order to safeguard the data when they leave the EU. A, the reality is there is a lot of confusion. I feel it every day. My team feels it every single day. There is a lot of confusion. That is generated by sometimes misguidance, sometimes a different approach from uh, the Data Protection Authority, um, sometimes generally cynical <laughs> scepticism from uh, some, um, you know, uh, some laws, some su surveillance laws um, that we have in certain countries. That's why I really echo what Paul said. I really feel that giving a try to this module will help to bring certainty. 
In the same vein as today, we are saying to the world with the, with the code of conduct that whoever adheres to this code, whoever implements the code in their processes, their agreements, their, their policy, we are indeed in compliance, not only with the GDPR, but we, with what 27 data protection authorities agree it should be. So it's even a more powerful tool. It's not we're saying we're compliant to the GDPR. No, we're saying we are indeed respecting what is the expectation of the data, the, all data protection authorities and the European Commission. That's, I think, what we're trying also to achieve um, with the modules on third country transfer. We're trying to bring that certainty. We're trying to propose a solution that will work and restore trust in the cloud environment. And also that will be setting the bar very high on what those measures, those approaches should look like. Now, obviously this comes with challenges. Some of the challenges Paul already outlined it. Some of the challenges related to the different jurisdiction that we're going to face. Possibly we're not gonna solve for all the jurisdiction that are outside of the EU. But certainly we can dip a little bit deeper on certain elements that today create a bit of misalignment. So understanding how to do a risk assessment, understanding how to do a proper data flow and give guidance even to companies that have less resources, that's critical because those are elements that build trust, right? The way you identify and understand what data do you have, where do you send it, that's critical uh, because that it's part of what customer wants to know, what everybody wants to know, what users wants to know. Also understanding what is the appropriate technical measure, what kind of encryption, what kind of anonymization, what kind of aggregation is that needed for the data to be, um, um, to be leaving the EU and yet feel protected. Um, in the same way, there are things that for me are achievable. So the way we respond to surveillance law or to a law enforcement access request, those are things where we can provide a standard for it, a standard that everybody should respect. And so this is why I think in the same way I fought to when I joined the code um, uh, four years ago, I think this module can be the next opportunity to have a clear discussion among the industry, understand among ourselves what are those elements that will set us apart have a thoughtful discussion with all DPAs, because I trust you, we went through all of them for the Code of Conduct, and, um, and get their guidance and come up again, I hope. I hope also that will not take four years yet. I hope we can achieve that in two years or so. I want to be optimistic here. But I want to make sure that, uh, that we have that standard, because that truly will be a standard. It's no more a matter of compliance. It's setting the bar for how the data will be protected. And we hope to do it with controls that are actionable, that are transparent, that are not the, the, the administrative burner that, for example, characterize um, the SECs and to certain ways also the uh, privacy should be for. Um, so that's you know where what we're hoping um, to do with the uh, with the, with this this, uh, this module. As I said, it's not going to be easy, but I want to also reinforce something that was said earlier that the code of conduct um that sorry that we should you know we are all part of, most of us are part of europe of us company that should be a freedom of choosing which which one which cloud provider you want to use and we hope that with the with the code we will leave that freedom to the customer to say i can freely choose whoever i want as a cloud provider because they're setting the bar so high that i'm going to trust them i'm going to be i'm going to hold them accountable and trust them and obviously, uh, from a personal standpoint, as I said, as a practitioner, um, a code that will set the bar, that will give certainty that I can show as a seal of approval. Again, it will certainly ease our operation, our interaction with customers, and obviously uh, it will ultimately uh, beneficial to our business as a whole. Um, so that's what I had, um, Gabriela. So I'll, uh, I'll uh, send it back. I will uh, indeed leave you the floor again. Thank you, Lorena. So we're going to start the Q&A session now. Actually, this Q&A session started way earlier because I don't know if you follow, but throughout the other sessions, we have already received questions about uh, third country data transfers. It's, it's clearly such a pressing issue. There's a lot of uh, 
skepticism, but still everybody is, is curious to, to know what we, we are trying to put forward and, and how did CSPs uh, responded. So I guess a lot of the questions that have been made earlier uh, were already responded by you guys. Thank you for, for the great presentations. I will put forward some more now. Uh, we still have a little time. So here we go. I'm going to start with uh, how did your clients, uh, business partners, uh, reacted after Shrimps 2 ruling? And how do you think this initiative will help you when discussing negotiating with clients on third country transfers in the future? Um, I open the floor. Somebody wants to. I, I can take that, Gabriela, if, if you want me to. Yes, please. <laughs> so, so first of all, as, as I mentioned at the, at the very beginning of the intervention of this panel, um, the, the, the Shrimps 2 decision has created a um, fair amount of legal uncertainty, um, in, in particular for, for customers of cloud providers that are the controllers of the, of the data. Um, and in our efforts, are, are very much focused on providing them with the assurances that they require. Um, so what we noticed uh, in, in those conversations that customers are increasingly asking detailed questions, both about the implications of the, the case itself, but on, on the data flows, on the measures taken, in addition, um, the safeguards required in particular, as my, my colleagues mentioned, organizational, legal, and technical safeguards. Um, the, the, the effect that Trump's 2 had is that it is a case-by-case -case undertaking that each of the companies has to do. But if we can have um, a standard, as Lorena has explained, where there is already a um, an approval from the data protection authorities that would be tremendously helpful in this process. We, as I mentioned, also we of course also hope that we have sustainable um, agreements between, in particular, the EU and the US on, on transatlantic data data flows. But it is it is really the scale and the approval from the DPAs up front that make this module really, really uh, important as a as a as a next measure in 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 the space in which we are currently. Thank you, guys. Also, feel free to to add if you wish and and interact with each other. More than welcome. Uh, we do have some other questions. Um, Here's uh, from Josep Bello. I think your first question was was properly answered throughout the presentations. Uh, so thank you for the for posing another one. So he says, uh, will the data processing agreements of the CSPs be updated more specifically with the code of conduct in mind, including the data transfer issues we are all aware of, and especially the recommendation by the EDPB. So I can answer that because that's um, your point of doing the code of conduct. So the code of conduct, which by the way, it's available for review by everyone, um, does set the details of the elements that should be included in the data processing agreement. That's the whole point. Um, obviously, not only data processing agreements, because the processing agreements, it's a reflection of internal process and, 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 and policies. So obviously, uh, but we don't, it's not only about uh, updating a piece of paper that we get signed, but it's really making sure that we have that all backed up by internal policies and processes that we have. Uh, so the short answer obviously is yes. Um, in terms of uh, updating them to Scrums 2, well, I hope everybody is doing that. I hope indeed that you're taking into consideration how to show indeed, um, especially with regards to transparency report and how you're going to handle uh, data access law enforcement data access request, that it's also another element uh, that indeed needs to be now included, or at least you need to have proof that you have indeed a policy and a processes to follow through, and potentially also transparency report um, that is uh, updated uh, every six months normally as per guidance. 
Um, so that that's um, that's what would be the recommendation um, from anybody that is doing this, and personally, that's what we're doing indeed at Cisco. Obviously, one of the elements that we're all still waiting on is the new SEC, which I hope to see it as well by the end of the month, maybe early June. Uh, but um, that will also be another element that needs to be taken into consideration and the moment that they are and uh, we will be indeed including them in the in our data processing agreement. They already are the old version, but we will be um, the necessary adjustment uh, for the new ones. Thank you, Lorena. Uh, that brings us to another question. So regarding the added value of codes of conduct, especially compared to uh, existing tools. Um, if I may, um, for me, the main <laughs> advantage of, of a code of conduct and also of a, a certification scheme is that it is pre-approved by the data protection authorities. Um, binding corporate rules that we also heard about earlier today are very important, especially for intra-group arrangements. Um, also, they will get the approval of data protection authorities. But this is much more important in your day-to-day -day relations with your uh, with your business partners. And um, this is not just about cloud storage. Uh, this is also about software as a service and and other um, um, other kinds of online services that can be covered by this code of conduct. Um, and since nowadays a lot is going online. Uh, this past 15 months, we have basically learned to do all of our work online. So also the number of software as a services and, and storage as a service and uh, basically the whole cloudscape has exploded in the past 15 months, especially the use of it. Um, and uh, for the day to day business life, having such a code of conduct with companies adhering to it. Um, uh, doing all the work to get to that declaration of adherence, because that is also more than just signing a piece of paper. Uh, as, as Lorena just uh, explained, you need to have all those policies and procedures in place. And believe me, if you look at that controls catalog, it is a lot that needs to be done. Um, and we're going to add more for those international transfers. Um, and you get then the certainty that the DPAs agree with the level of uh, uh, of, of detail and the level of work that you have put into your privacy program, um, which leads to better trust, more reliability. Um, and um, no, it will never be perfect. There will always remain more work to be done, um, uh, but we are good partners now with the Belgian DPA and with all the companies uh, working on this, uh, on this code of conduct. Um, so we will get to further iterations and further updates, um, but the legal certainty that it provides I think is a big benefit compared to, for example, standard contractual clauses that have not been pre-approved by the DPA, at least not when it comes to your uh, supplementary measures. Thank you very much, Paul. I will have uh, a final question and that uh, goes to Mark then. Uh, how did you adapt your internal and external procedures, Paul Schrems too? And how did this affect uh, the performance uh, of your company? Well, um, Google is committed to GDPR compliance and to helping our customers with their compliance journey. The ruling invalidated, as we all know, the Privacy Shield framework, but did not invalidate EU model contract clauses uh, or standard contractual clauses as a mechanism to transfer data outside of EU in full compliance with the strict requirements imposed by the GDPR. Um, and we haven't been offering model contractual clauses as a data transfer mechanism um, for Google Cloud as early as 2012, uh, which uh, was affirmed by the European Data Protection Authorities pursuant to the common opinion process in 2017, uh, demonstrating that they were in alignment with European Commission model clauses. Now, with respect to the supplementary measures, guidance from the European Data Protection Board on supplementary measures, as we all know, is pending. We're closely monitoring such developments and committed to helping our customers with necessary implementation. Um, Google Cloud already does offer technical, legal, and organizational protections. And what we've done in terms of our, uh, in terms of our products is uh, we, in, we incorporated uh, the standard contractual clauses by reference into all of our cloud agreements with customers, thereby tr uh, transferring reliance, not just on privacy shield, but also on standard contractual clauses 
And then we've also uh, released guidance for our customers with respect to technical capabilities that can help address at least some of the requirements that are indicated in the European Data Protection Board draft guidance, such as uh, customer held keys, organizational measures, um, transparency capabilities, uh, data location capabilities. But at the end of the day, uh, firm guidance would certainly be welcome not only by Google Cloud and our customers, but by everyone. But by utilizing this approach, incorporating uh, standard contractual clauses into our agreements with customers, uh, no longer utilizing privacy shield for our customers, uh, and, then, uh, and then reiterating our existing organizational technical measures, encryption, uh, data flow capabilities, data location capabilities, we hope that this combination will at least help us get by this, uh, this uh, uncertain time. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Ah, Lorena, you want to add something? Ah, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I thought I interrupted you. Uh, all right, so unfortunately, our time is up for today, but I would like to thank all of you guys again um, and for thank your colleagues as well. I mentioned many, many times today that uh, not only thanking for your work here today, your contribution here today, but throughout the whole the whole process. And this is indeed an unparalleled achievement. And as Scope Europe, we are very, very proud to work with such a commitment. Uh, a committed group of um, stakeholders. So thank you very much. And to get to know more about the UCloud PC, about the Third Country Moji Initiative, uh, please refer to our web pages, go to the UCloud CC, to Scope Europe, and make sure you stay tuned for further events and developments. Uh, thank you very much for attending today, and I wish all of you a great afternoon. <laughs> thank you, Gabriela. Awesome job. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. <laughs>